this particular presentation today rounds out a complete cycle. We've talked about how pairs are operative in the universe in which we find ourselves. They are also operative in any world that we could live in. And so paredness, which sometimes is phrased as doubleness, is very important for us to pay attention to. But so deep is the attention needed for paredness that only someone experienced with a deep symbolic mind is able to see that paredness, like a fractal, repetitive representation of existence, must itself always be paired so that pairs occur in plural. There are always pairs of pairs. There is almost never a single pair. And to think that there is a single pair is the flaw which comes through stopping at existence. In ancient times, the way that this was presented in oral teaching was that if you show an object and its reflection. And you understand the reflection and the object, like a hand held before water, and you see the reflection of the hand in the water. Or a tree growing over a stream, and you see the reflection of the tree in the water. The thing and its reflection. That something and its double. That that's a pair one misses an extraordinarily subtle, necessary transformation. If we just simply stopped there, we would be able to participate in existence, but never understand it. For there is not only the thing and its reflection, that doubling, which seems to be a pair. But the thing in its reflection as a pair is also paired with something else and its reflection. Something which is there has a reflection. And what is not there also in its kind has a reflection that is not there. In the first interval, and after every 12 weeks we have an interval, and we use the Tao Te Ching after the first 12 weeks of nature, just as today, after the second 12 weeks of ritual, we're using the Mundaka Upanishad. 12 weeks, then an interval, another 12 weeks, and a second interval. When we came to talk about the Tao Te Ching, which was exactly 13 weeks ago, in the first interval, I brought into play two words from high Sanskrit wisdom, not to complicate matters of understanding something already difficult, like Lao Tzu's Chinese, but because only in high Sanskrit wisdom were the words remembered, remembered in such a way that they were logically able to be brought into play together. The world doesn't think too much of Chinese logic, but Indian logic is superior to any logic in the world before 20th century mathematics made planetary logic in our time the hands-down class, classic favorite form of thought. In Indian logic, 
the two terms that were the pair of pairs, one term for what is there and its reflection. And that term was anvaya, anvaya. And anvaya in Sanskrit means co-presence. If there isn't a leaf, then there won't be a reflection of the leaf in the water. The thing and its reflection are co-present. Neither is there by itself. Both are there together. If there were not water, the reflection of the leaf would not occur in existence, but would it still be potentially possible? Yes. But co-presence, anvaya, is itself paired in high Dharma Sanskrit logic with something which we would translate as co-absence. The word is very difficult to pronounce. Vyatarika. Vyatarika. V-Y-A-T-I-R-E-K-A. Vyatarika. Now we talked about this, and you can go back to the cassette on the Tao Te Ching. We talked about how this works together. Co-presence and co-absence. Now this particular wisdom was also reflected in ancient Western pre-Socratic logical thought presented most precisely by Parmenides and by Heraclitus. We not only have something and its reverse, but there is a reverse of the reverse, which is the obverse, and then there's the other side of the obverse, which is the contrapositive. So that one could present the hand held up, and there is a back side to the hand also. But there's the hand that is in the other direction, and the back side of that. So that when one does a mudra to present this, one can do a mudra in this way, which implies that this pair is also possible. And so very often in later developments of wisdom, like in the time of the historical Buddha, which is much later, it's almost recent history, as a matter of fact, though it's 2,500 years ago, the way in which that meditation mudra was presented was that in sitting in the full lotus position, the middle finger of one of the hands, usually the left hand, would be touching the ground and the other would be raised in this kind of a mudra. And that's the presenting of that diagonal of the pairs, which itself has a pair of the reverse made obverse and the thing made into its contrapositive. All of this is to say that clear thought was always aware of a square and in fact even carried over into modern late 20th century uh, physics. When an understanding was trying to be had mathematically of how molecules affect each other in chemical reactions. The mathematics was uh, puzzled and was not able to work, be worked out until there was the development of the seminal idea that the influence of a molecule on another molecule has sandwiched in between the two molecules a kind of a square well, which mathematically one could then compute the increasing influence or the decreasing influence between two molecules.
the mathematics of the square well allowed for molecular physics in the late 20th century to come to understand how, in fact, things come together, stay together, or effervesce and go apart. In ancient high Dharma thought, which is as far removed from ordinary thought as uh, late 20th century mathematical physics is from uh, punk rock music, all of this was available if one understood that in this world of things and their reflections, there is a higher order, which is also here, but doesn't register until one makes a transform to that higher order, then the pair of pairs is seen to operate together. Now the Mundaka Upanishad is the classic presentation in ancient Indian thought of what I've been talking about. Mund, mund means to shave, and in one sense it means to shave away all that's irrelevant until only precisely what is real remains. It also refers to someone who shaves, who shaves away the grime, or who shaves away the hair on the head so that uh, someone who is uh, shaven, clean shaven, would be someone then who has taken away the hair of this world. Now the ancient understanding of this did not have all of the little folklore mythologies that were, have been added over the last 3,000 years. But the original sense was that the things that are extant in this universe grow out of the mysteriousness like hairs on the head. That what exists, exists because it has grown out of mysteriousness. And that if you shave the growth off, what is left is the mysteriousness. So that the hairs on the head were a physical symbol for the universe. And that a shorn or shaven head then meant somebody has returned to the mystery. Now this was used later on, for instance, in Buddhism. All Buddhist monks shaved their hair. That's only 2,500 years ago. The Mundaka Upanishad goes back at least a uh, thousand years before uh, the historical Buddha. So that Buddhism is a later manifestation of the kind of understanding that was there over a thousand years before. And it's not limited to India. It's not limited to a later Buddhist uh, interpretation of this and manifestation of this. Holy men in ancient Egypt also were clean shaven. The holy monks of ancient Egypt of 3,500 years ago, were also wore just simple linen and were clean shaven in the kitchen on the back of one of the doors next to a photograph of one of the astronauts on the moon. I have uh, an Egyptian priest from about 1400 BC so that you can see that this is something that's not to be associated with Buddhism or with asceticism in that kind of a tone, but is to be uh, in fact, understood to be revived in Buddhism, revived in an asceticism, but that it goes back to ancient times. And the Mundaka Upanishad is the kernel of the presentation of the truth of this a thousand years before the historical Buddha. So we talked about the Tao Te Ching at the end of nature, and now we're talking about the Mundaka Upanishad at the end of ritual. Why? Why are they chosen? 
out of the whole possibility of the world's great literature, why these two in these two special places? Because the movement of this education is universal. It's the ancient wisdom tradition. Once this is mastered, you could go back to any wisdom tradition anywhere on this planet and master it. It's like once you have learned to speak one language, the second language is easier to learn. And once you have mastered one language, you can theoretically master any other language. Whereas, if you have not mastered a language by the age of nine, mastering a language is neurologically so complex that you will never learn the language. Feral children who do not learn languages before the age of nine never learn language. Never. It is too complex. The gestalts are too refined. This particular education, in its movement, has a four-part movement twice. And we're at the close of the second of the first four. So we're midway. Now in the Mundaka Upanishad, exactly at the middle of the Mundaka Upanishad, the very last phrase of the first half, and before the first phrase of the second half, the very last phrase is, cut the knot. Cut the knot. This knot is a knot of ignorance. The words here, include the phrase Vikara Tiha Samya Vikara Tiha is very close to the Vyata Rika the co-absence that is to say the Sanskrit word for not is assonant with the Sanskrit word for co-absence And the reason for this would have been very hard to understand before late 20th century knot theory and higher mathematics. In the 1990s, one of the burgeoning areas of higher mathematics is knot theory. And a knot is defined mathematically as a one-dimensional movement of a self-avoiding in a three dimensional context. This is a something that that develops a knot is over its head in context and so it doesn't relate to it at all and it develops its movement in a one-dimensional sequence and a one-dimensional movement always ties what we would call a knot. It makes a scramble. But one of the curious things about a one, or even a two-dimensional, by the way, but a one-dimensional movement eventually always returns to its source. It's one of the peculiar truths of higher mathematics. A one-dimensional random movement will eventually always return to its source. Which means that every knot, in an esoteric way, is also a cycle, a circle. Every knot is a circle. And no matter how complex the knot is, its structure is eventually that of a closed circle. So that one could say, simply in truth, a knot is a direction that goes nowhere. 
doesn't go anywhere. It has an extended excursion into confusion and returns back to its beginning to simply go through the excursion again. And this is the ancient understanding of karma. And until you increase the dimensionality of a life, one will always go through this exact same knot. You will live this complicated, confused existence over and over again without end, world without end. And so the invitation of transformation was always an invitation for liberation from this conundrum, liberation from this knot. In the first Upanishad, the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, Brihad means great breath, Aranyaka means forest teaching. In the great breath forest teaching, one of the verses reads, and it, the name here, Yajna Balka, is the sage who um, committed the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad to um, uh, its written form. Yajna Balka said, since all of this, since all of this complication is overtaken by death, swayed by death, what then would it mean by the sacrificer to go beyond the clutches of death? Since this knot reoccurs in a kind of repetition over and over again, and someone who is sacrificing on an external way, who is making a ritual, who is doing a ceremony, would be astounded to discover that you have done this ceremony many, many times, if not an indefinite number of times. You have gone through this knot, this complication, a number of times. You have sat in this hot morning a million times and million times and gone through this. What would it mean for you to go beyond the clutches of this repetition? Yajna Valka says, the little tab to find, to pull, that leads to this liberation is speech, the discovery of language. The, through the organ of speech, through fire, which is the real, the priest of the real, the priest of the sacred flame, the tongue of flame is like the word of language, tongues of fire, tongues of speech. The priest of the real, which is your real self, that hunter who tends that inner fire, the sacrificer's organ of speech, this organ of speech is is a fire, a sacred inner fire. And this fire leads to liberation, leads to emancipation. Now in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, it takes all of these pages to present the Upanishad. It's very difficult to keep track. In the Mundaka Upanishad, it's simply three sets of two sections forming a hexagonal shape. Now this hexagonal shape of three sections of two parts each, that hexagonal shape is very much like a hexagram in the I Ching. In the I Ching we saw that there are 64 hexagrams that make up a mesh 
which characterized the universe. But one of the peculiarities of the hexagonal mesh that we know from higher mathematics is that a hexagonal mesh will never form a sphere. It will never close in upon itself. It is always, whether it is straight, whether it is curved, it never closes in and forms a sphere. There need to be auxiliary shapes to the hexagon structure in order to allow for spherically to occur. Usually they're pentagrams, sometimes they're squares. And we know from late 20th century, late means 1990, we know from 1990-1991 molecular chemistry that in fact it takes an even dozen pentagons to transform any kind of a hexagon network into a closed sphere. The key to this was the development of the insight to the chemical structure of the third aleotrope form of carbon. They're called fullerenes, named after Buckminster Fuller. And fullerenes were the third form of carbon, the first form being graphite, the second form being diamond, and the third form being fullerenes, discovered just less than 10 years ago, and only proven in the laboratory by 1990. They're very large molecules, very super material of carbon, and that whole realm of matter has never been investigated before. It's theoretically to have molecules of carbon which are so complex and so large and because they are hollow inside that the air inside of them, when slightly heated, would allow for the molecules to float so that one could have a form of matter that simply would float. It's curious, but the whole development of this material was trying to understand on a molecular level what makes aromatic smell possible in elements. In a way, the Mundaka Upanishad has this kind of wisdom that is so large that the structure of it is able to enclose a sphere of mind so light that it floats off the clutches of ignorance. Now the Mundaka Upanishad is found in something called the Atharva Veda. You've heard of the Rig Veda, 1,028 verses that are arranged as a, as a kind of a, of a book of ancient wisdom going back at least to 1700 BC, and I would say 1900 BC is more like it. The Atharva Veda, Atharva means sense, it means perception. It means to bring into uh, existence. The Rig Veda is for the celebration of the glory of reality, and the Atharva Veda is meant to bring it into existence, to allow for it to happen in such a way that cultural life can happen, families can take shape. In the Atharva Veda, which includes the Mundaka Upanishad, the very first verse is called the Purvam, and it is a verse which has one purpose only, and that is to encourage the retention of wisdom and learning. And it reads this way. The thrice seven that occur bearing all forms let the Lord of Speech assign to me today their powers, their selves. Now the word for thrice seven in Sanskrit is trisaptis, trisaptis. T 
T-R-I-S-A-P-T-A-S, Trisaptis, three sevens. It's very closely related to the word for Trismegistus, thrice greatest. Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes Trisoptus. And three times seven, of course, is 21. Just like 21 cards and the major arcana of the Hermetic Tarot. I know there are hundreds of books in the Tarot, but they quite amazingly miss their mark. The gestalts of the, of the tarot deal with co-absence as much as co-presence. And just having all the dictionaries of association leave one very flat, one-sided, and very ignorant about what really takes place. I've never spoken on the hermetic tarot in deference to my friend who speaks on uh, Kabbalistic tarot and so forth, but uh, one of these uh, days we'll have to do this. The ancient wisdom, when understood, when practiced, is radically different from what someone would guess it was. And so most of those people who teach guesses, they themselves would be surprised to need to unlearn what they believe that they know in order to come to see that what they didn't know was at least as important as, as what they did know. The Mundaka Upanishad is the place in the Atharva Veda that takes this initial purva, this first hymn for the retention of sacred learning, and develops the molecule of super size that is able to float off transcendently of the clutches of ignorance of a world which is hypnotized by co-presence. So that the realm of co-absence also occurs as a pair with co-presence. And when this happens, one's realization is carried into an interiority and the external ritual is paired up with an internal symbol. And when there is an internal symbol that's balanced in equilibrium to the external ritual, the existence which is made by the ritual is balanced by a transcendence which is guaranteed by the symbol. This is an extremely important aspect. The ancient way uh, in which this used to be presented in India a long time ago is that little girls pat mud pies, but mature women pat chapatis. If you try to live on mud pies, you won't last very long, but you can live whole lives on chapatis. The ritualist is like the child who is able to make the motions of life, but what they make does not bestow life. It takes a maturation and a different material. So when you do your ritual today, you're making very nice mud pies, and it's necessary to learn to make mud pies, but you have to take that learning and transform it so you can make chapatis because you can live on chapatis, but not on mud pies. But had you not made mud pies first, you would not know how to make chapatis. So the whole purpose of ritual is to learn the ways in which existence is made, but the development of the mind of symbols through language is the way to interiorize those ritual aspects so that they bestow life. Therefore, those who teach simply the clever ways to make the rituals 
are still children and do not bestow life. Now the Mundaka Upanishad itself, its three parts of two sections each, is itself then a special ceremony. It is a ceremony of language which interiorizes. It takes the rituals that are there in the Atharva Veda and shows that the interiorization of all of the rituals of the Atharva Veda happens in one key interior ceremony. And that the Mundaka Upanishad is the record of someone doing that ceremony right before your eyes, right before your presence. But they describe what's happening not in a descriptive representational way, but they present what is happening in a symbolic living way. So that when one reads the Mundaka Upanishad, one is enunciating a presenting language of an interiorizing ceremony that brings all of the exterior rituals of life to a single focus. And the symbol of that sacred, simple focus within was always a flame. A sacred fire. Literally, a tongue of fire. A tongue of flame. And because of its special nature, some of the late esoteric graphic presentations of it was a little flame on a heart. The fire of the heart. For instance, uh, Martin Luther's symbol in the Reformation the original symbol was a little flame on the heart. There is a lot of wisdom in this world that is glimpsed at momentarily and then forgotten. There's very rare wisdom that is passed on and is kept alive and in times of need brought out again. But what happens here, just to give you an example, in the Atharva Veda, and I have a big two-volume translation of the Atharva Veda and the accompanying Samhitas. The Atharva Veda has 20 books. The first 18 are the Atharva Veda itself, and the last two, 19 and 20, are uh, 19 as a kind of a, a summation of the Veda, and 20 are excerpts from the Rig Veda that have uh, paired parallel qualities to chapter 19. In the 18 books of the Atharva Veda, it's divided into three sections, but not equally, not 666, but 756. So that the first two sections, the 7 and the 5 of the Atharva Veda, are weighted in such a way that one of them is missing a chapter and the other has a chapter too much, so that they fit together and they form an even 12. But the third section of the Atharva Veda, the sixth, is already the medium, the balance of the two first sections brought together. So in a way, the Atharva Veda has, in its entire structure, a cycle of tw seven, a cycle of five, and a cycle of six. Three cycles, three wheels. And the place where esoterically in the Atharva Veda, the transform of these three is brought to a symbolic interior is in Book 14, which talks about the marriage ceremony. The ancient High Dharma marriage ceremony, going back who knows how many tens of thousands of years, the first written down the Atharva Veda somewhere around 4,000 years ago. The marriage ceremony in there in the 16th verse of the 14th chapter of the Atharva Veda is one of the keys to understanding the Mundaka Upanishad. Because the bride, she is called Surya. When the bride goes to the house of the groom, she goes in a three-wheeled chariot. And it says in verse 16 of book 14 of the Atharva Veda, that the priests of this world, the ones who do the ceremonies, the ones who do the rituals, who teach people 
about ceremonies, who teach people about rituals, they know about the two wheels of the chariot, but only those who are enlightened know about the third wheel of the chariot. And that's all it says. And if you don't know that the bride going to the groom rides in a three-wheeled chariot, you will never understand anything beyond simple things in the reflections. And this world is all right, but it has the peculiarity of tying the same knot indefinitely. It follows the laws of karma without cease, and there is no liberation from it there. One has to transform to a higher order. One has to add dimension, which means that one has to give up the stubborn energy that one has in one's karma in order to transform into the dimensions of the context. One has to get out of a one-dimensional willfulness or even a two-dimensional plane of reference and get into at least a third dimension of the sphere of the context of what's happening. So that when ritual, just simply done, does not take into consideration the context in which it is done, it is acting in a one or two dimensional way. And so good ritual, good ceremony, always has this alertness, this awareness that comes, how is it that the context is occurring along with what we're doing? It's a hot day, but there is a slight breeze, and the reflection of these veils in front of the lights is slightly moving, and it's the same kind of motion that you would see by an overlay of leafy vegetation in between a hot sun and a bare ground. If you had only one vegetal frond, in the way. There would be a shadow on the ground of the single frond. But when there are multiple fronds, the shadows are multiple so that they are confused and no form occurs except a kind of mottled, non-defined splotchiness. But in the splotchiness of the dark is also a splotchiness of the light. And one gets a curious kind of a shimmering quality. And the shimmering shows the attentive observer that there is not just one form in between the source of light and the ground upon which one is seeing the reflection, but multiple. And so the shimmering that occurs in the knot of ignorance is the indication to the enlightened ones that there is a multiple dimension that needs to be taken care of. Not just a context of two dimensions going to three, but of going to many dimensions. At least five. The three dimensions of space, the dimension of time, the dimension of consciousness. At least a five-dimensional and in that kind of a context, when you're taking care of that kind of a context, the existential establishment by the ritual of doing gains a kind of radiance to it. And this radiance can be measured. It can be measured, can be understood. The measure is language. Language is the measure. And so language can be understood. It has its forms. It has its pace. It has its rhythm. And when language is understood in its forms, one is able then not only to interiorize words, that is, add words to the ritual, but one is able to interiorize the forms of the words along with the cycles of the rituals. And so you have 
than a curious kind of a marriage possibility, the marriage of inner and outer, the marriage of the bride of the world with the groom of the transcendent interior. You have the wheel of nature and the wheel of ritual, which are like the regular wheels of the chariot. But then you have the third wheel of myth, the wheel of language, which is an interiorizing process, which allows for one to go to this sacred nuptials of the true establishment of wholeness. That wholeness is different from the supposed wholeness of the ego. The true wholeness is called in the Mundaki Upanishad the imperishable person. And the Sanskrit word for that was Purusha. It's the same word that appears in the Bhagavad Gita. As long as Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita is simply Arjuna, he does not move one iota off the dead even in, which is the knot of his existence. But as soon as Krishna awakens the Purusha, Arjuna is able to move again. The Mundaka Upanishad has the Purusha. We'll put it on the tape for, for the record later. But here's how the middle of the Mundaka Upanishad occurs. This is the translation from uh, Radhakrishna. Divine and formless is the person. Without and within, unborn, without breath, without mind, pure and higher than the highest and mutable. Divine and formless is the person. The symbol for the divine and formlessness of the person was always an aura, a radiance. And the radiance always had seven rays. And you hear a lot in 19th century occult uh, lore about the seven rays and the theosophists writing about the seven rays and their children making 4,000 years ago in the Mandaka Upanishad is the origin in writing in the written tradition of an ancient oral tradition going back tens of thousands of years. The seven rays are these. I guess we should put this on the tape. Let's come back and we'll, we'll talk about these seven rays. We're talking about structure. Now we're talking about structure because we would like to understand that there's a strategic situation happening today. That in the first year of our education, this is the middle day. This is the day right in the middle. This particular Saturday closes out the first half of the first year and prepares for something which has not yet occurred, which is next week, which is the first day of the second half of the first year. Today has a co-presence quality about it. Next Saturday, which has not yet occurred, has a co-absence quality about it. This Saturday fits in with next Saturday just like something co-present fits in with something which is co-absent. And so these two pairs, the pair that's co-present and the pair that's co-absent, form a square. So that if you were making a belt out of the line of the first 52 lectures, the place where the square belt buckle would be would be today and next week a week from today, seven days from today. Now notice that we still measure time in a cultural way by the week. In terms of our personal orientation, 
in terms of our individual movement, we go by the day. But in terms of a culture, we go by the week. And in cultures that had a larger sense of context than we have today, the actual movement was in terms of double weeks or fortnights. And anything larger than the fortnight, the double weeks, which was the month, was not a cultural context, but was a celestial or a divine context. If you measure time by the day, that's talking about us. If you measure time by the week, that's talking about the culture. And if you measure time by the month and the year, that's talking about divine laws. Three different cycles. So if you compute time by the day, the next level is to compute time by the week. And the third level, the third cycle, is to compute time by the month. And so you have the individual, you have the cultural, and you have the celestial. Three different cycles. And in these three different cycles, there's a structure that rotates, not on the rim of the cycles, but the spokes that make the circle of the rim hold together. And those spokes are seven. And because there are three cycles, there are three sevens. There are seven spokes for the day, there are seven spokes for the week, there are seven spokes for the month. What the Mundaka Upanishad identifies for us. Towards the end of the first half of its structure are the seven rays, which are the secret structure of the day. And that knowing that secret structure of the day, one can then transpose and know that that same secret structure holds for the cultural seven for the weak, and it holds for the divine seven for the celestial. But they're invisible. Those seven rays are invisible. They're not seen by someone who's just looking at externalities. They're only manifest radiantly when one gets to a transcendental personality called the Purusha, the imperishable person. And just as existence comes out of nature and gives an objectivization to nature, the mind will come out of language and gives an objectivization to language. The Purusha, the imperishable person, will come out of something which we today call vision, but used to be called magic. It has to do with consciousness. The person comes out of a magical nature. And so there are three objectives, three objective qualities that exist. And the image of existence is the mask. And the image of essence is the idea. And the imageless image of vision is the Purusha, the imperishable person. And while the person could never be given an image, if one would see the spiritual person, you would see a light so intense that it would not record as a form at all. And the only thing that would record is the structure of the seven rays surrounding it, surrounding him, her. 
And those seven graves are recorded for the first time in written language in the Mundaki Upanishad. It's in the first section, uh, the second uh, part in the fourth verse. The seven moving tongues of fire are the black, the terrific, the swift is mind, the very red, the very smoky colored, the sparks blazing, the all-shaped goddess. So you notice that there are not seven colors at all. I have nothing to do with that. I have nothing to do with seven tones. All of those are later interpolations. All of those are much later. And actually have a lot to do either with Hellenistic or with medieval correspondences that are strictly irrelevant in terms of high wisdom. They're like extraneous facts that are nice to know. And it's like uh, Parker Brothers uh, Game Monopoly has, the, has that kind of relationship, say, to uh, Alexander's Ecumenica. Yes, it has something to do with acquiring property, <laughs> with gaining riches, and with the lucky rolls of the dice, and not going to jail, and not collecting $200. Yes, but it's vastly different. The Mundaki Upanishad says, for someone who does rituals only, you can do rituals forever and never understand anything. And the whole purpose of doing the rituals is to prepare yourself so that you can't understand. And when the understanding blossoms out of the ritual, the understanding takes the existence of the ritual with it. It doesn't leave it behind like a husk, but it takes it with it like a fragrance. So that existence is not something to be thrown away, but something to be taken along. And that when that existence is interiorized, that's what makes the mind real. The mind is real because the life was extant. Mundaka Upanishad, when it begins, begins in this way. It begins with a tradition of Brahma knowledge. Brahma arose as the first among the gods, the maker of the universe, the protector of the world. He taught the knowledge of Brahma, the foundation of all knowledges, to Atharvan, his eldest son, a father teaching his son. It's the image of the transmission of tradition in a culture. But that lineage of teaching goes through a double switch, almost as if you have something moving this way and something moving the other way. It's like the two fish in the astrological sign of Pisces. There's a kind of a of an exchange, interchange, there's a crisscross that happens here. The knowledge of Brahman, which Brahma taught to Atharvan, and Atharvan in oldest times taught to Angiras, he in his turn taught it to Satyavaha, son of Rajavaja, and the son of Rajavaha taught it then to Angiras, both the higher and the lower knowledge. Notice here that the wisdom doesn't just keep going in a linear fashion, but there's a place where there is a crisscross. If one keeps the line of knowledge pure, they will make no difference at all in the crisscross. But if there has been slight variations, slight attitudes, the crisscross will cause confusion. 
And so at the beginning of the Mundaka Upanishad, in order to prepare this writing so that it cannot be read by the ignorant, this kind of key is put in the front of it. Because at the very end of the Mundaka Upanishad, it says that this is not for everyone. This is only for the few. That this learning is indeed something which is reserved for those who can understand it. We talked about this morning, earlier, about how a ritual establishes existence. And existence is the empirical world. It's a world of things, of objects, like masks. This world of things grows out of nature, just like hair on the head grows out of the head. And there is a way of shaving away what is extant and revealing thereby the mystery as the source and the base. In the Mundaka Upanishad, they use the ancient term Bhuta Yani. It means the source of all being. Bhuta Yani. Not Buddha. Bhuta. Bhuta Yani. And the Mundaka Upanishad says that in this paired, from this Bhutayani, this paired existence, all things come into being in paradise, like there are as many demons as there are gods. Gods and demons are created at the same time. They form a pair. If there's only one god, then there's only one demon. If there are many gods, there are many they're always balanced evenly. The demons are those who go only for exterior rites, where the gods are the ones who go for only interior rites. And that part of being enlightened, of being wise, is to understand that neither by themselves is essentially real. That they always go together. And because they go together, they make a wholeness which can only be seen on a higher dimension of context. The whole purpose of the Mandaka Upanishad is to invite, through written language, the reader to participate in getting into a context large enough that one sees gods and demons as part of a whole. And in order to see that as part of a whole, one has to inhabit very large dimensional quality of the real, which includes consciousness, so that the Mundaka Upanishad is about consciousness. Language, the tongue that one speaks, like the tongues of flame, fire and language have a similarity. They go together. It's like in the early apocryphal uh, Hellenistic Jewish Christian uh, understanding that there was a kind of a descent of fire from the Holy Spirit upon people in Jerusalem about 44 AD. And uh, as these tongues of holy fire from the Spirit went on to them, they were able to speak all languages. It's called glossolalia. Speaking of all tongues, they spoke in tongues. And the speaking in tongues is still today in tent tops across the uh, 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 fundamentalist uh, uh, Christian revival meetings. To speak in tongues is the sign that you've been touched by God. If you can't speak in tongues, then you haven't been touched. I remember once in a black holy roller church in Berkeley, California, about 35 years ago, of seeing the arrival of the Spirit 
of the Holy Ghost and people spontaneously bursting into uh, singing in languages that one could not understand and yet they understood. And the overlay of all these languages produced a kind of a craziness to someone who was outside of it. But if you were inside of it, if you were there, it was like the shimmering of many fronds all together showing the splotchiness of the light and the dark. And it had that kind of quality, it had a shimmering quality. And you could see because in the hand gestures of the congregation that there was a rhythmic use of the hands in a very special way. Instead of the shriek of madness, the hands came up like this in the shimmer of praise. And because one could see the shimmer of praise in the hands of the congregation, you knew that they were in the spirit and not electrocuted by it. Because they'd been properly prepared by the minister, who wouldn't know anything about the Mandaki Upanishad, but who prepared them to, in his words, you have to be ready. Because if you're not ready, then the devil is ready for you. If you are ready for the spirit, then receive it. If you're not ready for it, then what's going to get you is the devil. You can either receive or be gotten. And you have a clear choice. You have a clear choice now. Are you ready to receive or are you going to be gotten? The devil's ready to get you, but you can escape his clutch if you are only ready to receive. Because if you present, instead of something to be got, and you present only your openness to receive, the devil has no way to clutch openness of the spirit. But the Holy Ghost can come in its presence and be there in your openness. And it's a way of California black holy water preacher talked about the Purusha, the people who didn't know anything about it, but did it just the same, exactly in the way it's always been done. So this is not something so far out. In fact, it's the very core of what makes ritual still real. When you do your ceremonies with the masks today, those masks are brought together. They're brought together as a kind of a rim, as a kind of a circle. The masks themselves are on the circle. But your activity, whatever it is, whatever you do, is the structure that allows for that circle to have a form. And it's the same structure because it allows the form, the same structure allows for the no form to also occur. So that the structure of the ceremony and your masks have a co-presence. And there's a co-absence also established by a transcendence of openness that's going to be there but is not there yet. For both the makers of the masks and the makers of the ceremony. And because you inhabit both those positions, you have made the mask, you are doing the ceremony. That future co-absence belongs to you, just like the openness of the spirit. And you cannot be got by any clutching, but you are ready to receive something which was not there before. Something that now can come in. Now this is a very, very strange kind of a way, and the ancient Sanskrit word for enlightened was not buddhi, but adapti, adapti, a-d-d-h-a-t-i in English, adapti, and that's the word used in the Mundaka Upanishad. It's like advaita, it's like going beyond. An English word that would be similar to it is to put the AD, to add odd 
to say like venture and get adventure. The adventure of the spirit is related to the venture of existence. If you don't venture existence, there's no base upon which the adventure of the spirit can happen. But if you venture existence, if you do the rituals in such a way that they lead to an openness, an, a prehension of the appearance of something not quite there but invited, that gasp will arrive. That invitation will be responded to. You have to cross your fingers and hope. It will happen because it's universal law. A co-presence invites a co-absence to occur. And when the co-absence occurs, the co-presence exchanges its place. And that's how transcendence happens. We bring our physicality here together and we assemble it in such a way that it leaves an openness. And when the co-absence comes into that openness, all of this transcends and is able to be freed, to be liberated. Because what comes in from the mystery is well able to handle the plane of existence. And what was on the plane of existence transcends to the sphere of the mind. That's how interiorization happens. The energy that allows for this transformation, this exchange of secret selves to happen, is language. Language. So that in the Mundaka Upanishad, there is a phrase that begins the second of the three parts. The phrase is tat etat satyam. Tat etat satyam. Tat literally means this, as in the phrase tat avamasi. This art thou. But in the Mundaki Upanishad, the phrase is this, and the second word is that, and the third word word is usually translated as truth. And literally it means this, that, truth. Three T's. Tat, etat, satya. This, that, truth. A truth of this, that, together. That this and that, together, is a truth. Now we've lost through the kind of psychological instruction that's favored in this culture, we've lost the sense that truth bears a very special relationship to meaning. You can generate meaning, but you cannot generate truth. When you generate meaning, if meaning is generated in such a way that it has an openness in its center, that center can have acceptance given to it. And a definition of truth, if you're listening, Mr. Pilot, truth is meaning accepted. When you accept meaning, then it is true. It's the acceptance, the acceptance which cinches meaning into truth. But for acceptance to happen, there has to be an open. And when acceptance is offered, what actually occurs is something which is related to acceptance. It's called absorption. Acceptance is the energy of co-presence, but absorption is the confirmation of co-absence. That's to speak in a mystical way. When we get to myth next week, we're going to have our first pair of texts. We're going to have a man and a woman. We're going to have Plato's Phaedrus, and we're going to have 
Inanna. And so Phaedrus and Inanna are going to be our first pair, the man and the woman. Now you can use any translation that you want. Uh, I like Diane Holstein's translation of Inanna. It's sexy. She uses a lot of erotic language, which is entirely appropriate to talking about the Queen of Heaven and her stories of ascent and descent. But there's also a version of it in Poems of Heaven and Hell from ancient Mesopotamia in the Penguin Classics. The Penguin Classics version of Plato's Phaedrus is very good. This one by R. Hackforth. Yes, yeah, better if you're philosophically inclined. I use the single volume of Plato, the Collected Dialogues of Plato, and I noticed, for instance, over here at Aldean's Bookstore, there's a used copy for $12. All the dialogues of Plato in the best translations. I like to use this as a single volume, and the Phaedrus uh, in this is not too bad. Uh, it begins about page uh, 470. Is it 475? 475. This is one of the greatest of the dialogues, and it should be read with the symposium. The two together give Plato's idea of love. Now isn't it interesting that Plato is talking here about love in two different dialogues, one called the symposium, which is a circle of people, a circle of men. And only because the circle is open in the center is there something that can be received from the outside. What is received from the outside is what the Phaedrus delivers. The Phaedrus is a conversation between Phaedrus and Socrates on the fact that love is a spirit and cannot be commanded, but can only be invited. And the symposium is about the form that men must take in their language about love to invite the spirit of love to be present. And Inanna is all about the spirit of love whose real presence is in a co-absence always and only when that co-absent presence is brought in the center of human openness does it become real in the sense that it gains existence. talk about this next week. The father of the woman who wrote Inanna was um, one of the greatest of all the kings of antiquity. And I'll show you his uh, portrait, which has survived in gold. And it was his daughter that wrote Inanna. That was uh, 4,400 years ago. So we're going to start with that pair next week. But notice that that pair next week goes together with some one thing that's a pair here this week, that is the Mundaka Upanishad in itself, is a whole pair brought together. What is the pair that's here? The pair that's here is that the Mundaka Upanishad endorses ritual. It endorses the doing of ritual in such a way that the very center of what we do is left open in the spirit of acceptance. And if your ritual is tight, that every aspect in the circle is given the dedication and the intent by the participants, that circle will achieve a form of existence. And at the same time that the circle achieves the form of existence, the presence of the center of the circle, which is not anything in and of itself, will also have a quality of existence. The acceptance will have a quality of existence. And if that acceptance has the quality of existence, it will be able to existentially accept something from the mystery that is co-absent, but naturally comes together 
and rest there. The ancient form of this was always that sacred sites were in circular forms and in the center of the circle a space was left open. In the, in the way in which in Salisbury Plain about 4,700 years ago, Stonehenge was set up as a temple to this kind of quality. At the very center of a circle of land was a circle of stones. At the center of the circle of stones was a circular uh, place where there could be a fire, but there was no fire there. And so the earth was put in a circle, the stones were put in a circle, and a space at the center of those circles was left open. And when the sun struck through sunlight, the center, it illuminated and gave a fire, an interior fire, to those circles. Ritual can establish the circles and the cycles of life. And if the circles and cycles of life are established in such a way that they are open, they will receive, by the very invitation of their openness, something which is co-absent, which comes in and establishes itself there. This is the flame. Man may offer his heart, but only God makes the spark of light on the heart come alive. It's this kind of quality, and the Mandaki Upanishad is all about this. It reads here, Book 3, Section 2, Verse 5, The Nature of Liberation. Having attained Him, capital H, having attained Him, the seers who are satisfied with their knowledge, who are perfected souls, free from passion, tranquil, having attained the omnipresent self on all sides, those wise with concentrated minds enter into the all itself. How do they enter into the all? Because the all enters into the openness of their acceptance at the center of their forms of existence and allow for them to leave the circles of earth, the circles of stone, and aromatically effervesce, and go back to the mystery, go back to the source of the all, go back, it's called the Bhutayani, the source of being. It reads also, the ascetics who have ascertained well the meaning of Vedanta knowledge, who have purified their natures through the path of renunciation, they dwelling in the worlds of Brahma at the end of time, being one with the immortal, are all liberated. This is to say, anyone who goes along with the acceptance is transcended, is taken with that motion. Let me put it in a Hollywood melodramatic way. When the angel of the presence sweeps in with its co-absent wings, it creates a draft in the corridors of existence, and that updraft of that carries away everything that's lighter than air. Anything that's in that openness will be carried in that updraft and return back to the starry expanse of universal mystery. It's a melodramatic way, but that's exactly how the, Mund Mandu the Mundaka Upanishad, and then it reads this way. He, verily, who knows the Supreme Brahman becomes Brahman himself. In his family, no one who does not know Brahman will be born. He crosses over into sorrow. He crosses over sins. 
liberated from the knots of the secret place of the heart, he becomes immortal. This very doctrine, now declared in verse, those who perform the rites, who are learned in scriptures, who are well established in Brahman, who offer of themselves the oblation to the soul seer with faith, to them alone, one may declare this knowledge of Brahman. To them alone, by whom the rite of carrying fire on the head has been performed according to rule. This is the truth. And that's how it ends. This is the truth. It's very difficult when we try from the outside to piece together what this could mean. It's very difficult if one doesn't participate in the flow of the language to even understand what somebody like myself, for instance, is saying here. The key to it is to have faith that if we look for the next three months, the next 12 weeks, at the way in which myth, the way in which language interiorizes existence, we will come to be able to, three months from now, look back, look back upon what we talked about today and align in a lecture 13 weeks from now lecture that's going to happen 13 weeks from now with today, with the lecture that happened 13 weeks ago. When we line the Tao Te Ching lecture with the Mundaka Upanishad lecture, and 13 weeks from today, a lecture on Wilka's Sonnets to Orpheus, we will be able to, through that kind of a alignment, be able to cut through the knot of confusion and go to a transcendent level. And we'll be ready then to study symbols. But we cannot do that until we have looked at experience. Because only by looking at experience, at bringing experience out, will what I have said today have any possibility of having a meaning that could be accepted. The meaning is there. The meaning is on the tapes. 13 weeks from now, we will be able to be in a position to accept that meaning and make it true for ourselves. We can't do it today. The most that we can do today is to do what David did before the Lord, to dance with all our might. That's all we can do. Yet at one time when he was young, that's all David could do. But when he got older, after the experience of many wives, and many lives, David was able to sing psalms. And David is remembered today for the royal psalms more than for his dancing ability. It is the psalms that made David king. But he could not have sung the psalms had he have not been able to commit himself to existence with all his might and deliver it 100%. The dedication of the seeker that delivers 100% of themselves in existence has prepared a ground of the zero left over as being the exact place where the acceptance is optimal. Co-absence is 100% in that zero. If our co-presence is 100% leaving a zero, then that zero that's left as a gift will be inhabited by 100% of the divine. That's the secret exchange of selves. That's why it's a mystery. That's why we hope that you'll be back.